Will you bow your heads and pray with me? Almighty God, we indeed celebrate this day. We deck our souls with gladness of what you have done for us in the gift of your Spirit. We thank you, Lord, that you did ascend, that you went back to the Father so that your Spirit might indwell us, fill us, send us out into the world to receive your love, to love others in your name. Lord Jesus, you told us that if we love you, we will keep your commandments. And you have been so abundantly faithful to us. Would that spirit that dwells in us lead us to be faithful to you, to do the things that you command, to do so joyfully? We lift up Cadence and Palmer to you, especially this morning, Lord, that you would be doing a good work in their young hearts, that you would raise them up to know you and to love you and to serve you and to see in you the one who keeps all covenant faithfulness and calls us to live into our vows, to renounce the world and to serve you to the glory of your name. Father, I pray this morning that every word out of my mouth and every meditation of every heart in this room would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight as we depend upon you as our only rock and our only redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. So it has been a sweet but overwhelmingly busy week here at Christ Church. I came into my office this morning expecting to see some notes saying, that's enough, I quit. Um, but I didn't. We were so busy. Staff, clergy, volunteers galore. This place was a buzz this week with the good work of God. I the list of things that happened are innumerable, but a few things. We had graduation for Eastwood Christian School this last Thursday. We had a lovely worshipful wedding here just last night. Uh, and this past Wednesday, Price and Dinah McLemore renewed their wedding vows right here at this altar. It was the 20th time that they have done so. Every year on their anniversary, Price and Dinah recommit to the covenant promises that they made years ago. And if you ask them, they're bold to tell you that that holy practice has strengthened their marriage year by year. It's carried them through tough times and given them joy in the smooth ones. Now, this may seem like a very odd way to start a Pentecost Sunday sermon, but I have an assignment for each one of you in the week that lies ahead. If you are married... I want you to do what the Macklemores did this past week. So if you visit our website, we have a little document there you can download. It's just a little order for the renewal of wedding vows. It's very brief, and it will lead you through a little service. Now, you can call me or Father Allen or Father Morgan. We're happy to meet you here at the altar to do the short few minutes it takes to renew those vows. But you can also gather your family around and let them serve as witnesses. You can let a child or a family member or a friend be the officiant. However you do it, it's a precious thing to remember on a regular basis. The promises that you made before God, that you would love one another through good times and bad, to have and to hold and to cherish one another until you are parted by death. Now, if you're not married, but you might be one day, especially you young adults and teenagers out there, your assignment is to read through the wedding liturgy in the Book of Common Prayer. You can just Google 2019 wedding service and find it without problems. And I want you to pray for God's help, that His Spirit might be in you, raising you to be the kind of young man or young woman who can keep a covenant and that he might help you find a fellow believer who's willing to courageously commit to the sacrificial vows that are at the very core of Christian marriage. Now, your assignment, if you're here and you've never been married or you've lost your spouse to death or divorce, your assignment is this. Remember that the Lord is our first love, and he has graced us with a mighty family in his church. And every one of us, regardless of whether we are single or married or divorced or separated by death, we're wrapped up forever in the greatest marriage story the world has ever known. 
You know, the Bible begins with a marriage, and it ends with a marriage. And that marriage includes all of us, no matter where we are in our walk in life. For he has committed himself to us as the God of all creation. For we are the bride. We are his beloved. We are his church. And as the perfect bridegroom, Christ has fulfilled every covenant promise that he ever made to us. So again, strange way to start a Pentecost Sunday sermon, but my prayer on Pentecost is that it might be our highest joy to fulfill our covenant promises back to God. Whether we were just baptized like June or Cadence, or whether we're nearing the end of our earthly lives, may we be faithful to the one who is faithful to us. Pentecost is a celebration of the fact that God made a whole series of vows to us throughout Scripture and throughout recorded human history. He promised us that He was going to pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. And Pentecost is the celebration of the fact that He did so. And the Macklemore's renewal on Wednesday and Summer and Kyle's vows last night, they resounded in my mind and my heart. I kept hearing God saying that I'm the great vow giver, I'm the great vow fulfiller, and it's my spirit living in you that allows you to do the same. Those moments of marriage reminded me powerfully that I'm a part of Christ's bride. I'm a part of the church. And he loves his church so much that he died to make our him he died to make us holy. Our wedding vows are always a mirror of that reality. The man promises to lay down his life for his wife. He promises to risk everything in order to be generous towards her and to shepherd her towards holiness. The woman promises to honor and to trust and to love her husband so that he might be raised up to be the holy man of God that he was created to be. Both the man and the woman promise to mutually submit to one another, and that reflects the character of God. For he loves all things, he endures all things, he's willing to sacrifice his very life out of love for you, out of love for me. Pentecost is a profound revelation of that fact. He fulfills his covenant promises to us, He sends His Spirit on us this day, and you realize that it is only then that Jesus' great sacrifice on the cross begins to bear fruit in our lives. Jesus, like a husband in a godly marriage, risks it all to show us the generous heart of God, the God who longs to shepherd us into the everlasting holy places. And through the gift of His Holy Spirit, The church is empowered to become holy, to live like the bride of Christ, like the bride, the wife in a godly marriage. We become empowered to use all of our varied gifts with joy as we strive to cherish the one who sacrificed himself for us out of love. My friends, we were made for relationship with God. God formed you. He formed me from the very dust of the earth for one purpose, and that is that we might be a member of his church, to be his bride, to be an intimate friend with the Lord of heaven and earth. And so on Pentecost Sunday, God sends his spirit to us. He fulfills that promise to never leave us comfortless and to lay it all on the line out of love for you and for me. And so this Sunday, In the midst of all of those celebratory hymns, it calls us to ask ourselves, how shall we respond to the love that God showers on me and you on Pentecost? Let me leave that question hanging and turn with you with God to God's Word. I want to begin in that reading from John's Gospel, where Philip opens with that question that reveals the longing of every human heart. We just want to see God. Now, the world around you doesn't realize that they have a hunger for beauty and they have a hunger for meaning. 
They want their lives to account for something. They, they need purpose in their lives. They don't realize that that longing is actually just a hole in their heart that only God can fill. All human striving, all human searching finds its origin in this desperate plea. I want to see God, and I want to know what this life is all about. Philip puts it well in verse 8. Lord, just show us the Father, and it will be enough for us. And Jesus gives Philip a deeper answer than he could have possibly have been expected. He tells his disciples that they had seen the Father in the work of his Son. And then in verse 12, he says something that even more amazing was about to be revealed. Because Jesus promised that when he ascended, the Holy Spirit was going to come and fill that void left in the world by the ascended Christ. God promised to send his spirit, the helper, the revealer of truth. And in that empowering spirit, the disciples and you and me were going to be empowered to do even greater things than Jesus did. Now, I don't know about you, but it always strikes me as like the weirdest Bible verse in the entire scriptures. Like, how am I supposed to do more amazing works then did Jesus, the very Son of God, the one who was perfect in all ways. How can we, no matter how powerful the Spirit is, do greater works than Jesus? I believe that what Jesus means is this. If Jesus had not ascended, he would still be here among us in his resurrection body. And the Christian life would be about jetting all over the world to wherever he was, filling some football stadium or concert hall. That would be what life would be all about, finding Jesus in his physical form. But instead, Jesus left, and he sent us his spirit. And his indwelling spirit makes every one of us who have given our lives to him into little Christs. That's literally what Christian means, right? It means little Christ. And that means that the face of God is not limited to a Jewish man living in first century Palestine. Rather, Jesus is everywhere that we are. Little Christs span the globe. And they have for the 70 generations that have existed since the time of Jesus' ascension. You and I are little Christs. We are the church. We are the bride of the bridegroom. And we get sent out into the world to bring the good news of what God has done for us in Jesus to the whole world. And that is what God promised he would do. He would pour out his spirit on all flesh. On Pentecost, God sends the spirit of truth to reveal his goodness to the world. How shall we respond to God's call to be little Christs in our marriages, in our families, in our schools, and at the club? In our lesson from Acts, we see the birth of the church. The Spirit of God comes into the world and we see this former ragtag group of 'er ne'er-do-wells suddenly ablaze with the gospel of God. We hear them proclaiming the gospel in every language of the known world. You may remember that Pentecost was a Jewish feast. It was the festival of weeks. And they celebrated the giving of the law to Moses on top of Mount Sinai. So on this day that we celebrate the giving of the law, we see the Lord giving us grace. We see the Lord giving us his spirit. He gives his bride, his church, his own heart, so that we might know his mercy and that we might be empowered to serve him and obey him and to follow him into holiness and peace. God promised that he would do this. And on Pentecost, he fulfills that vow to make you holy, to make me holy, even as he is holy. How shall we respond to the holiness that God grants us on Pentecost, in our marriages, in our families, in our places of work, and in our places of play. 
In our reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, we learn that God's Spirit has come to build up His church. You know, God did not send His Spirit to you so that you could kick back and take it easy, knowing that you're in and there are others out there that are out of the family. Rather, His Spirit has empowered you with gifts. He's given me spiritual gifts. Everyone apportioned as God sees fit so that we might contribute to the praise of God, that we might contribute to the spread of the gospel. My friends, all good gifts, all good acts of righteous service, all godly activities find their beginning and their end in the empowering spirit of God. And each one of you have gifts. We would love at Christ Church to help you figure out what your spiritual gifts are. But that plurality of gifts has only one focus, and that is the upbuilding of the church of God so that we might do the work that he's given us to do. On Pentecost, God sends us his spirit that we might witness to his goodness to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost ends of the earth. How shall we respond to the mission that God bestows on us at Pentecost, in our marriages, in our families, in our schools, indeed, everywhere that we go? I've asked a bunch of questions along the way here, so let me close by helping answer some of the questions that we've asked. God has never and he will never fail us. He vows to do things, and he keeps every one of those vows. Pentecost is a day where we see him fulfill so many. He promises to send us the comforter. He promises to give us his own power to make us holy. He promises to pour out his spirit on us that we might be empowered to be his witnesses to a broken world. Pentecost is this great yes that Jesus says over his bride, the church. And so what do we do in response? We say yes back to him over and over again every day of our lives. In our wedding vows, we hear a man and a woman promise to forsake all others, to cling to one another no matter what. You know, you don't promise that you love someone on your wedding day. That's easy. You promise that you will love them in the days that are to come, no matter how hard it is. Where do we find the power to do so? Where do we find the indwelling spirit to, to do that work of loving even when it's hard? The very spirit of God. And a couple has to recommit to that promise over and over again every day. Every Christian life is like that with God. We cling to God no matter what, and we renew that promise to love Him every single day. Today, we heard parents and godparents make vows over precious Palmer and Cadence, but those are our vows too. Those are the vows we make to God in our baptism. We vow that we will renounce the world, the flesh, and the devil. We vow that we will turn to Jesus and receive him as our Savior. We vow that we receive the faith and the scriptures. We vow to keep his will and his commandments, and we are terrible at it, aren't we? But that's what his Spirit says. You don't do it perfectly. No one has but Jesus. But God doesn't leave us in our sins. He doesn't leave us abandoned in our failures. He sends the comforter. He sends the helper. He sends the spirit to make us his bride. May we never forget our first love, Jesus Christ. May we be filled with the spirit afresh and anew that we might love our spouse and our neighbors and our friends and our enemies the way that God loves the world, that the dying world might see the faithful bridegroom in us, the one who loved us so much that he got up on the cross to redeem us from our sins. Amen? Amen.